The discussion around cybersecurity and artificial intelligence at the Billington Summit centers on two main themes. One is using AI for cyber protection. The other is protecting the AI tools themselves. Eric Trexler is Senior Vice President for U.S. Public Sector at Palo Alto Networks. I ask him what he sees both in securing AI tools and in using AI to secure entire enterprises. We're seeing a lot of activity around, around co-pilots where people are leveraging co-pilots to make their tools easier to use. We're certainly investing a lot of time and money in that for our customers. Where we're not seeing as much attention is around security on AI. So the governments are looking at whether state, local education or federal, how do we employ AI for better citizen services to speed things up, whatever it may be. But similar to the early days, and in some part now, in cloud security, they're not thinking about how do they secure data, intellectual property, and that capability. One of the things we're doing right now, we've already brought technology to market, is to secure AI usage and tool sets within organizations. So your private IP doesn't leave the agency's boundary mm -hmm. in a query request or something else without you knowing about it. So giving you that visibility and that control. And then the other component that the industry doesn't talk about enough, in my opinion, is how we've leveraged AI over the last decade plus to make the tools faster. So we get billions of pieces of malware every day at Palo Alto, we see it, or files. And we need to make rapid determination whether those are valid files or malicious files or activity of any sort. So we use neural networks, we use machine learning today because humans can't keep up with that map. It will never scale, will never scale humans out. So we're using a lot in what we call precision AI to make deterministic decisions on the fly really quickly. I'll give you a quick example for all your listeners. When you're using a co-pilot, when you're using Gen AI, pick your tool of choice to do something, the margin of error is a couple percent. 10% margin of error, two plus two may equal 73, that's a problem. When you're doing that to make deterministic decisions based on malware, you've gotta be in the one in hundreds of thousands or millions because those can be catastrophic events. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it precision AI as opposed to what the industry spends a lot of time on, which is generative AI. Mm -hmm. uh, use the term there that I really like, co-pilots. Yeah. And it strikes me that the, the name is important because it signals to the employee, this is not something that's going to take my job or take away the tasks that I have. It's going to help me do the job I'm already doing. Am I on the right track there? You absolutely are. So I'm a, I'm a student pilot right now. I decided late in life to go and learn how to fly. It's There's a lot going on in that airplane. And when you're a student, you can't keep up with it. Your co-pilot or instructor pilot helps you look for other air traffic, helps you change frequencies and do the things you need to do to be a faster, better, safer pilot. Same thing with co-pilots in technology. How can I ask a question? Maybe I don't need to be as skilled, which allows entry to a larger percentage of the workforce. How do I ask a question of this technology, this tool, and get an answer back that I need to do my job? Think of it as an enabler. A lot of times in the scientific era, We'll talk about human machine teaming. It's really a partner with you. you. You see it in technology, you see it in flying. The military's bringing you on board with drones. Mm -hmm. So a lot of cool stuff coming, really exciting in the world of AI and cybersecurity. All right, you alluded to something a moment ago that I think potentially is a little troubling, and that is that yeah. you would like to see more people paying more attention to data protection. Yes. What are the gaps that you see and what would you like to see agencies do to close those gaps, Eric? So I, I think there, there are two things. One is awareness of, of risk around data. Is this piece of data valuable and in what ways and how do we protect it versus this piece of data? So, so the first component would be a general understanding of risk within the organization, the agency. The second component I think we really need to drill down on is outcome-based security. Today, we, do, we continue 15 years after I've joined this cybersecurity industry full time, we continue to buy tools and technologies and not fully understand the outcome that the business, the agency, the organization desires. Mm. So I will go buy a DLP tool or something else 
without understanding the risk involved in that data and why, why it's important, why it needs to be protected, and then how I do that in the construct of the defensive, aid, the defensive nature for the whole agency. Have you seen organizations on maybe a one-off basis break that cycle? And if so, how have they broken that cycle? What's the change in mindset? What's the change in culture, whatever, that's helped them to break that cycle? We have. It's more on the civilian side. It goes to what we call platformization, what most people in the industry recognize as consolidation in the security space. Today, the average, the average customer has somewhere north of 35, 40, upwards of 100 in some cases, cybersecurity tools. It's impossible to integrate those all together in a cohesive outcome-based strategy today. So as we see zero trust theories and, and architectures coming on board, we're also seeing a consolidation of, of vendors mm -hmm. in the space. Today, the federal government will spend about $26 billion on cybersecurity. About 90% of that goes to integration of technologies, deployment, creation, and the like, employee salaries and everything else. About 10% goes to the OEMs. We've got to do a much better job standardizing cybersecurity for our customers to drive to those outcomes. The best customers are doing it, driving on zero trust initiatives and understanding what those outcomes are. And it's a lot better when you integrate it on the factory floor as opposed to the customer floor. Eric Trexler of Palo Alto Networks.